Good. Okay. So thank you again for the questions from the last session. And I'm confident that the index card material will really put you ahead of the game. And I just would want to point out that when I've told this to people before, they've said this is just a tremendous amount of work, actually. And the fact of the matter is, is that it seems <coughs> that way. But when you put a strategy like this to work for you, it actually uh, it reduces your work to a great amount uh, of fr basically you free up so much time for yourself by having a strategy like this so don't let the sense of what seems like is more more work uh, distract you or push you away from trying this because it actually creates more time and just as an example i wrote three novels while i was a grad student and wrote a dissertation and published stuff and was active in the film industry, uh, film culture, and the small publishing culture, and I was playing music, and I made solo albums of spoken word poetry, and was performing in the city, and I had that time precisely because when I went in to do my studies, I had a strategy, and it was rock and roll. Like, there's no wasted time on looking at books without a strategy, and oh, I'm, uh, how am I going to get all this information in my head? So, just to briefly sum up, index cards are magical, and they're miraculous, and they're just a beautiful way of preparing yourself in addition to having memory palaces prepared, which once you start doing it, really takes five minutes to get a good memory palace together, even less. So th this is really powerful stuff. Now we want to get into how to recall memorized information. And I just want to point out, I'm feeling that I've maybe been a bit vague on how these images and actions come together in order to help you actually memorize stuff. But there's some examples coming. But the principle really is, is that once you've got stuff memorized, there is a strategy in how to recall it and actually overcome certain things about forgetfulness. So we want to get into that now in a very dedicated way. And I want to introduce you to a guy that you may or may not have heard of named Herman Ebbinghaus. And his dates are there. And he shockingly didn't live for that long. He's a very interesting figure in the history of memory studies. And he didn't, as far as I know, really have memory techniques. But he was basically trying to understand how his memory worked. And he did it in a basically scientific way. But what we need to understand is that he experimented on himself and there wasn't a whole lot of research with other people so we wouldn't really consider it in sen in the sense of him being a scientist doing empirical trials with other human beings he primarily focused on himself now some of the things that he came up with were the idea of the forgetting curve the learning curve the spacing effect the primacy effect and the serial positioning effect, and this was gathered together in a book called Uber das Gedächtnis, which is in English not called about memory, but memory, a contribution to experimental psychology. And I think that, that the English translators have given it that term, a contribution to experimental psychology, says a lot about the fact that he was experimenting on himself and he was contributing essentially anecdotal evidence and really, really powerful ideas, powerful ideas that have really great application to what we're talking about. But one thing I want to say is that a lot of what he says makes sense, and you will have recognized these things in your own life, and you will have suffered from them in terms of forgetfulness and so forth. But what I want to say is that you don't have to, and none of this stuff has to be real. You can hack it. You can overcome it. And again, he was experimenting on himself. His ideas have become viral, and people think about the learning curve and the forgetting curve and all this sort of stuff. But it doesn't have to be true, and I don't really buy all of it, even though I love the concepts and you feel like you want them to be true. But uh, they're not. Well, they are, but they don't have to be. Or they aren't, and they can be. It's just different things. One of his major concepts is learning and retention degrade, not just degrade, but they degrade exponentially, both in time, right? They, they degrade over time, what you've memorized, the information, but also in the position. So there's a relationship between when you memorize something and when you begin to forget it, and where, where or w in what order. Position means the order that you memorized it. So memory, memorized information degrades both over time and with respect to when you memorized it. So 
there's something called the primacy effect, and the more time you spend, it is said, on memorizing something, the more attention you give it, the more primal, or not primal, the more primacy you give it, the greater the chance you give your mind to put it into long-term memory. And the idea is, is that this is happening due to processing. You're not only just paying attention to it, but you're processing it. One of the things that I find in very, very difficult about this concept is that actually looking at information is not necessarily processing it. Actually reading and writing can obviously involve some level of processing, but the fact that you're spending more time attending to something does not mean you're processing it. And this is the, the debate about spaced repetition software and these sorts of things that bring back information on structured patterns. Just because you're paying more attention to it and you're paying attention to it in, in structured ways doesn't mean that you're actually processing it. And I always call spaced repetition software the blunt force hammer of learning because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're processing. You're just sort of bombarding yourself with the same information, praying and hoping that it will get into your memory at some point. But let's just say that what Ebbinghaus said about the forgetting curve, memory, memorized material degrading exponentially, let's just say that that's true and ask ourselves, what happens to the forgetting curve when we use his ideas of spacing, the order in which that we memorize material, and we put our attention on how that we can work with this stuff. What happens if we think differently about the time that we spend on memorizing? What happens when we think ab differently about how we position what we've memorized? And what happens when we think about processing information? Harry Lorraine told me in the interview, and he said it many times, but I always like to say that he told me, because he did when we had this interview, but he said, the reason why that we forget people's names, for example, is because we never paid attention to them in the first place. And these procedures that I've been telling you about, using memory palaces and then creating associative imagery, just to go back to that example, a guy ki kissing a tiger with Statue of Liberty, that's actually doing something more than processing. That's processing information in a particular way by associating it. And so you're not just looking at it in general with the idea that because you've read it, you're adding it to a pool of things that you already know, which of course you are, and things will go into your memory because of that, but you're paying attention to it and processing it through association by enlivening it, giving it context, and using your imagination so that your imagination is learning and memorizing it as well. So what happens when we approach things that way? All of these ideas that Ebbinghaus identified. Well, this process of questioning all of this has led me to come up with what I call recall rehearsal. And, you know, I just have said some negative thing about spaced repetition software being the blunt force hammer of learning. Uh, but recall rehearsal is spaced repetition, except for the software is you. And you choose the pattern based on strate strategy, and you also do it from within your mind. So instead of having externalized software or index cards or flashcards that you use to memorize stuff, you're actually using your imagination as the index card, as the spaced repetition software that's bringing you the information. And we're going to talk about that in detail. And one of the things that makes recall rehearsal work magically and amazingly is that it's a way of organizing and tracking how you're memorizing. And it's well known that what we measure, or it's theoretically well known, and I've seen that effect in my own life and in the lives of many people that I've studied who engage in these things, including everyone from Benjamin Franklin to Richard Branson. If you are measuring what you do, what you do improves. And so we can do that with our recall strategies as well. So what I'm showing you here is how exactly that I go about setting myself up to create information using Excel files in order to set up a rehearsal recall or recall rehearsal strategy. And this is coming from my dissertation where I did friendship. I did friendship in the movies, but in order to 
begin thinking about friendship in the movies, I needed to understand friendship philosophy, and I needed to understand it in a very big way. And I didn't want to just understand it and have a passing familiarity with it. What I wanted was mastery, so that when I w talked about it and presented it in my defense and went through in the field exams, I was able to say some very, very good things because I had built knowledge about it. And so what I did is I created an alphabetical system of memory <coughs> palaces. And I made folders for, or Excel files rather, I made a folder for the memory palace code or the key of all the different memory palaces that are all linked to particular philosophers who had written about friendship. And so the memory palace key, you saw earlier all these Excel files which are alphabetical, they are linked to different philosophers and different memory palaces. So Aristotle is the philosopher who talked about friendship in great detail in the Nicomachean Ethics, and he also talked about it in other areas of his philosophy, but that's a very, very major area. And so Aristotle starts with A. I have a friend named Alan, actually Alan Haig Brown, amazing writer if you ever have a chance to check out his stuff, and he's an amazing photographer as well. If you know that photograph of me sitting at my desk, he took that, and uh, he's a very, very nice guy, and I, he also let me babysit his, or house sit his house while he was in different parts of the world. And in any case, I know his house very, very well. And his name happens to start with A. So we have Aristotle and we have Alan. And so I'm linking this so that my mind has a place to go when I want to recall stuff that I've memorized from Aristotle about friendship, A, A. And uh, next we have Bataille, and Bataille, of course, is a very strange and obscure philosopher who talks about things in really encoded ways, and what helps understand people that are extraordinarily difficult to read is to identify their key points strategically, not too many, three per chapter, ten per chapter, whatever the case may be, and memorize that material. And where it would it be the best place to memorize it? Well, why not in a memory palace, in this case, Brocklehurst High School, which, which I've just indicated here as being Brock, and so on. I can go through the entire list, but you can see it and study it for yourself. The key point here is that the name of the philosopher is linked to a memory palace that also starts with that same letter. So this is very, very powerful in enabling your mind to go where it needs to go, and it's quite good. So experiment with this. And there's different ways of organizing this exactly where this key is. So for instance, you could imagine that the alphabet is on a keychain. I don't find that really necessary because the alphabet is already itself a structure. It's a structure that we know familiarly from a very, very early age. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. So it's just a natural structure. It's like a building in a way that has multiple stations. So we can leverage the power of the alphabet. Now, here's looking now inside of one of these files, and this is Aristotle. And I don't have the entire list here, I just wanted to show you a few things, but it was actually 24 stations in the actual practice. And so what you see here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 12, and you see the name of the station. So in this case, it was the bedroom and the bathroom and the washing machine and the stove and this patterned journey that goes in a linear formation and allows for walking mentally through the place without having to think about what comes next because of the familiarity with the place, because of taking just a short amount of time to make sure that I'm not crossing my own path and make sure that I'm not trapping myself in the memory palace. And then what I have here recorded in this Excel file is that philia covers family, but not voluntary friendships. And we'll get into exactly what I used to be able to recall that in a second. But I just want to point out that the reason for doing this, for making this record, as I mentioned before, is to give the subconscious mind a feeling of security that this procedure that I'm going through is not going to lose something. I think that one of the reasons we struggle with our memory so much is that we have the fear that we're going to lose our memory, and it's a cultural thing. You're going to lose your mind, you're going to get old, you're not going to be able to remember anything, and we are also 
afraid of losing things. We're afraid of losing our keys, losing our, getting our car stolen, you know, uh, all our possessions. The whole idea of having insurance, house insurance, car insurance, is all this crazy fear of losing stuff, and we have it in our mind. So one of the things that I did, came up with this for, was to combat this, to overcome this effect of fear of losing, so that I could, you know, do experiments, make sure everything's working, and have something to come back to, to refer to. Incidentally, these points were also on index cards. And I would never memorize anything verbatim from these books. I want to actually be able to have it in my own language, right? If I want to memorize actual quotes from the book, can do that. But what's more powerful is to be able to go back to the index card for the actual quotes for writing, for re-representing that material. So j this is just basic points of what the material is. So another example, quickly, is the Jacques Derrida Palace. And Jacques Derrida, of course, wrote The Politics of Friendship, which is a very good book. And here we have, uh, I just to protect the uh, identity of the innocent, uh, this was a grade six teacher. And uh, her name started with J, so J and Jacques. Normally, I would try and do the last name linkage. But in this case, I had a palace for D already taken. And I just needed one for Jacques Derrida. So I went with his first name and linked it with Mrs. J's classroom. And uh, here, actually, she had two classrooms. She had the music room, where we studied music, and then her main classroom. And so moving through there, we had the piano, the podium where she stood, the different corner. There was a drum set there. There was where I sat in the class playing my trombone, and so forth. So again, the number of the station, the, what the station actually is, and then the information there as a kind of record. Now, what we've done by this point is read the material, for instance, Philosophers on Friendship, in a strategic way, as I've suggested, and we've captured the information on index cards, and we've charted out a memory palace, and then used Excel file or an equivalent. One of the reasons why I use Excel files, you'll see that sometimes the lines went over into the next part, is to force myself to just have the essentials. It's like Twitter for Excel file, or Twitter for <laughs> students, is that just by seeing what I can compress there, I make the information much larger because I'm actively engaging my imagination and my mind to think about exactly the shortest possible way to describe this so my mind can fill in the blanks, use the associative imagery on a much simpler level without complex things, without needing more than one station, which you would really need typically for uh, verbatim memorization of poetry or uh, things of that nature. And just being very, very, very compressed in order to turn that stuff into atomic material that's going to explode when memorized into all kinds of recall possibilities and information and knowledge, actually being able to generate knowledge from it. So that's where we are now. That's the setup. Now, in terms of actually memorizing material and recalling it, we're going to use, or I'm going to suggest that you use, bridging figures as part of the Memory Palace journey and your strategic recall rehearsal. I've been told many, many, many times that the idea of the bridging figures is the best contribution that I've brought to mnemonics, and that's been said on mnemotechnics.org by several people. I think that they're probably right. I've never encountered it anywhere else, but surely somebody else has done this. But nonetheless, I've really described it, and it's very, very powerful, the idea of bridging figures. And so why not connect at another level our journey through a memory palace by having a figure follow that journey. So instead of just seeing random things happen from station to station as we move linearly throughout the memory palace, and so if to use our Statue of Liberty alligator kissing thing, instead of having uh, the man kissing the alligator with uh, the Statue of Liberty, and then moving on to the next one and having King Kong fighting Godzilla, and then at another one having a clown with uh, a shark. Instead of doing that, why not have the, k the author go along for every part of the journey? He's bridging every part of the journey so that there's continuity. So in this sort of example, to remember that philia is more appropriate to familial relationships in friendship, that word philia, um, because a lot of people misunderstand. And I don't want to get into the whole thing with 
with this, but a lot of people think that philia in ancient Greek uh, it has to do with all friendship, but actually it was more appropriate to, to family, and uh, there were other forms of friendship that were important between friends that were not related. In order to memorize that, I have Aristotle feeling up my friends, and, and, uh, or my family rather, inside of Alan's bedroom. And uh, Alan's bedroom is probably a good place for people to be felt up. But instead of then going to another image, I take Aristotle with me to the second station. Or I just see Aristotle moving to that. And uh, in order to remember certain facts about this idea that the, um, there's a certain you know, importance to certain people that isn't there in other people because of friendship having to do with pleasure and friendship having to do with utility and then friendship having to do with a certain level of virtuousness, I see... Aristotle bashing the Pope and enjoying bashing the Pope on the head with a badminton racket while he's pumping gas at, uh, at a gas station in Allen's bathroom, which is pretty strange to have a, uh, a bathroom there. And the reason is, is because um, uh, friendship, Aristotle breaks friendship into three different c- types. There's the friendship of pleasure, friendship of utility, and friendship of virtue. And actually the Pope is not particularly virtuous in some people's opinions, but I used him as a symbol of virtue to remind me of that. And I used the badminton racket as a symbol of pleasure because friends of pleasure like to do things that involve like sports, for instance, or playing games. And utility comes from the gas station. Um, So friends that really just use each other to create uh, jobs or, you know, People are often friendly with one another without actually taking pleasure from one another. They're trying to, uh, to create wealth or do some sort of uh, joint venture or something like this. So that helped me r- memorize that. And then Aristotle would go to the third station. Aristotle would go to the fourth station. Aristotle, Aristotle would go to the fifth station and so forth. And he would be integrally involved in helping me recall the different points. Same thing with Derrida. Incidentally, Aristotle is a hard guy to look at because there were no photographs, but Derrida, he's like really easy to see because he's got this shock white hair and, you know, you could have him with the cigar and so on. Now, this point of Derrida um, being in the musical room by the piano is singing, I'm just a gigolo. This means nothing to most people, but to me, it means that he's trying to to make the point that in Aristotle's book on friendship, it's a very, what he calls, phallocentric or phallogocentric uh, presentation, which means that it's orient- he just orients specifically on friendships between men. And Derrida cites this as a huge, big problem. And I'm Just a Gigolo, which was David Lee Roth's song, is, of course, a, ve- a very sexist pig kind of song. So it helps me remember that point. Now, the next point, Derrida is knighting my... Uh, best friend Clayton, and he's doing it a bit too hard. And that's to get this energy and this excitement and this massive, exaggerated sort of thing of someone being knighted too hard and smashed and so forth. And he says, you are here. And that's, uh, sorry, the idea that Derrida has that uh, that uh, the friend is somehow knighted and you're always putting them up on a on a pedestal and so forth and making them basically the hair to your knowledge, to your value. And this is an idea. I mean, again, I don't want to get into uh, what all this stuff is, but it, it helps me recall that. And then I'm able to begin talking about it. And I also say I want to say that this was in 2009, so I haven't really revisited this stuff. But at that time, I was really, really sharp at being able to do it and just quickly seeing this information, decoding it, and being able to connect it with all this other stuff as I wanted to. And I didn't have to start at station number one. I could go to station number 10 as easily as station number 20. But this is basically how it works. You have identified a piece of information. You've placed it where you, along the journey, you then create associative imagery. And I want to stress, it doesn't, it's it's hard to really uh, show you exactly how exaggeratedly this piano is being played singing I'm just a gigolo. It's loud and it's bright and it's vibrant and it's really, really big and it's super exaggerated. And again, Derrida isn't just knighting my friend with this sword. He's bashing him with it, you know? And it's just really, really intense. And the re- and that's just in the memorization process to really explode this sort of thing so that you get that rubbernecking effect while you're walking through the memory palace and you just want to, you just need to look at it. 
So this is basically what you're going to do when you recall the information as well. It, when you do this recall rehearsal, you're going to revisit that journey, and you're going to do so in a linear manner, but here's where we're going to start getting over the forgetting curve because there is this sort of idea that what you memorize more recently is better recalled, and there is this kind of idea that what you memorize in the third position or the fourth position of information is not nearly as... Per, uh, it doesn't have a, 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 a very good position in your mind, and so you're more likely to forget that. So in order to combat these ideas of the forgetting curve and so on, we do a little bit of mathematical calculations. And one thing that you can do is Dominic O'Brien's rule of five. And this is quite well known in the memory community, and it's a specific strategy of practicing recall so that you're encouraging the information to go into your long-term memory. So let's say you've memorized 10 things. You want to review it immediately. What does review mean? Review means actually walking through your memory palace. If you're not using memory palaces as some other technique, then you want to review it in the way that that technique would be reviewed. In this case, the immediate review is through the memory palace. The second review, he says, is 24 hours later. Then he says one week later, one month later, and three months later. And I think that that is pretty good but we can do better and we can do more because we're people as students who are paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in order to be able to have the opportunity to work through ideas, to create ourselves as better citizens and hopefully professionalize ourselves and get degrees and so forth. Um, and this is something that probably isn't going to help that much because we need it faster, we need it more with greater integrity, and we need it, you know, sometimes in tight conditions. So you might not have an exam three months later. And also, I just think that there's another problem here because, at least in my reading of O'Brien, he's also talking about doing this recall in a linear fashion. And if we do things in a linear fashion, then we're going to have the serial positioning effect problem, and we're going to have the problems of the forgetting curve and this idea that memorization degrades exponentially in, in terms of, how of, of the recency effect, how recently that you encountered it. So how can we hack this? Well, we create our own rehearsal recall thing. We are informed by O'Brien. His stuff is really great. But we want to come up with our own specific needs, our own experiences with the magnetic memory method I'm teaching you now. And we want to figure out our own needs in, in really detailed ways. And also, there's just a systematic strategy that I'm going to teach you that I have used and that I think you could use as well. But again, the, it's a method that I'm teaching you, not a system. So what that means is you want to adapt it, learn from it, apply it, and see what works for you, not have some sort of fantasy that do ABC and that's going to work exactly as prescribed. It, what I'm really focused on teaching people is methodology that by default needs to be kind of brought into your own practice and developed in your own personal ways. And you'll follow, ultimately, a lot of these strategies, but you shouldn't really get too caught up on doing them exactly because it's a method rather than a system. So to overcome serial positioning effect, you want to perform recall forwards and backwards and from the middle. So what I've represented here is moving linearly in the order that the material was memorized in f uh, you know, the beginning of the memory palace journey to the end. Then you want to practice doing it backwards, which of course is in O'Brien's book as well, and his work and many other people's works, the idea that you should be able to go forward and backwards. But the extent to which people actually go through this has, has, has yet to be seen. But the other sort of thing, in order to overcome the serial positioning effect and the recency effect is also to identify the middle of your journey and move backwards to the beginning and from the middle to the forward. And you can also play games. I haven't made a slide for that, but one game that I used to play that was really, really fun was to get a bunch of dice and uh, roll the dice and, and go to that place in my mind. So I'd see number six or I'd see number 18 or however many dice were there to reflect how many memory palaces were, roll the dice, throw them out and go, ah, what was, that, what was that position? And 
this is a, a drill that you can do in order to help overcome the serial positioning effect and help overcome these things that Ebbinghaus is talking about, which I think are both realistic and not realistic as well, because as we're building knowledge, as we're building frameworks, we're beginning to actually be able to move around in our minds quite easily and quite nicely that don't necessarily decay in the ways that are suggested there, but they definitely don't have to decay if you're rehearsing your material in a strategic manner, and these are some sort of hacks, so to speak. So the next sort of thing that you want to work on af after you've gone through these procedures is to actually test yourself and to actually compound what you've memorized so that it goes into long-term memory and to do it in a patterned way. So you want to first finish memorizing your material have some confidence that you've got it and then you want to start running your first recall rehearsal patterns using your own rules that you've set and I've suggested some ones for you to use and uh, here's the thing the thing that a lot of people don't do you want to remove yourself from the source material you do not want to be in the same place I did this for a long time I sat, and I, and I do, this is even after I came up with the Excel file thing and going backwards and forward. I used to do it right in front of the material. And I would just go through, have my eyes closed, and then I would look immediately, right away. And this is not helping anything. This is not encouraging me to turn this into knowledge. It's not encouraging me to put it into long-term memory. And most importantly, it's not really relying upon the power of my imagination. And so if you are not removing yourself from the source information, from the records that you've kept, you are essentially not using your fullest possible powers, you're not practicing them, and you're not getting the benefit of long-term memory. So remove yourself from books, index cards, Excel files, everything. Go sit in a cafe, go somewhere with a pen and a piece of paper. If you really like, you can use your plain text file uh, plain text program in your iPhone or whatever you have to write. I think it's better to write by hand. I don't want to get into it, but there's real good scientific research that by handwriting you get a better effect in terms of general cognition, in terms of when you actually handwrite stuff. And y you can look at 59 Seconds by Richard Weissman for the actual research because he cites it and it's very, very compelling and I found the effect from doing that. But the point is, is you actually pretend that you're the teacher and you give yourself an exam and then you go and you write down everything you memorize. You can write it in a linear fashion. You can write it in a backwards fashion. You can write it from the center or the middle in, ev in whatever way that you want to practice that. But the point is, is to test that it's there. And uh, then you check it against the record. So you have externalized it from your imagination using your imagination alone. Be relaxed. Don't do this in a state of anxiety or frustration, but use ex relaxation in order to overcome any frustrations or doubt or whatever may be in your way and put that stuff outside of your mind relying solely on th your mind. And then check it. And if you find that you haven't gotten things as clearly as you wanted, if there was something you couldn't recall at all, then you want to troubleshoot this and you want to do it by compounding and you want to take that associative imagery and think, why isn't that working? Why isn't it giving me the recall that I want? And compounding is can involve changing things, replacing the associative imagery, or working on focusing on that crazy colors and bizarre actions and so forth. Or it can involve adding something new. And typically, I think that adding something new is a very good strategy it dep so long as you're not cluttering things and making things worse. All of this comes through experimentation. So you have a, if you're using this, you have a real need to actually experiment with what's going to work with you. But in general, compounding is just somehow troubleshooting to make sure that it's working. And you're not going to have th the ability to compound if you're constantly looking back and forth while you're testing your memorization material, memorized material. You need to isolate yourself to reproduce it, to really feel that. And the magical golden thing here is that you're actually getting it into your long-term memory but through several procedures at once that you're doing in real time. You're accessing your memory, you're accessing your writing, you're accessing your creativity, and you're engaging in this material. So like Harry Lorraine said, we're not paying attention to material in the first place. That's why, that's the real reason why we don't memorize it. Well here, you're using multiple 
uh, ways of engaging with this material all at the same time. And this effect is very, very powerful, and it overcomes these issues that Ebbinghaus identified. So some common problems that you'll need to troubleshoot as you're growing into this method is that your memory palace may not be constructed correctly. You may not have the stations well ordered. You may not have enough stations. You may have too few stations. You may be crossing your own path. You may have built yourself into <coughs> dead ends. You maybe haven't been working in a state of relaxation and that has sort of interfered with things. You may not have prepared the target information in the most ideal way. The images that you've created may not be vivid enough. The actions may not be zany enough. You may have mindset confidence issues, which of course goes back to the thing about relaxation, but you also might have this scarcity mindset that I talked about before, where you just can't, you just can't get over the, f the, over the fear that you'll never be able to learn enough. And you, you, that's preventing you from getting started. That's preventing you from actually just getting out there and getting, getting things going for yourself. And I think this is a great way of, of doing that if you have any of those problems. And then, of course, there's always sleep issues, diet issues. And the big one for me, and I think it's just golden for the people who practice it, is just relaxation. Removing any kind of pressure upon yourself. Even though that pressure is there, making deliberate steps to lower the pressure is just overcomes so much and it brings your imaginative ca capacity up in really incredible ways. So... To sum up, you can hack your memory. You can overcome things. Even without, uh, the, by things I mean these, these decaying, degrading, exponential forgetting problems that Ebbinghaus is talking about. You can overcome that. And even if you don't do this recall rehearsal, it's well known that you will still experience memory benefits. And I don't want to give you that as an excuse to not go through this stuff because if you want true memory mastery for your goals, you do want to go through these steps but you'll still have an effect without that, uh, and you'll have an effect that can be quite long-term. But you want to, for as long as you want this information, you want to be rehearsing it in sort of a strategic manner, and you're going to need to experiment. Keep in, in mind O'Brien's rule of five, but come up with your own things as well, and everybody will have their, their really their own thing. So again, I want to stress that systems are, are rigid, methods are flexible. And uh, yeah, then if there were any questions, maybe we can make that big again, um, or it's okay as it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that part. So there are a number of questions. Uh, I'm starting with my question first. Um, wh what do you understand exactly? I mean, okay, we we un we you you went through the recall techniques, right? The different ones and. Um, and how long does it take to to really I internalize them, right? In, I mean, setting up the system and then internalize them, and um, you know, f from a total beginner, how long does it take to get into the flow? Well, when I first began, it was incredibly fast, and I don't uh, have any stats. I didn't really create stats, but later I'm going to show you some uh, a blog post that has this information that someone has tracked themselves using the magnetic memory method that I teach. And it's incredibly fast, and he was a beginner. And uh, myself, it's, al it, it's always completely engineered or based upon what the information is, what kind of conditions that it's being created, uh, the I associative imagery is being created in. And it has to do with me being disciplined with my own stuff. You know, I, I, have to, I have to admit that I have to be hard on myself to actually do some of this stuff. It's actually incredibly easy, and it's fun, but even the most fun things, like I play bass, I love to play bass. It's the most amazing thing, and I still have to push myself to actually do it. So if I'm not using these techniques, then it takes much longer. And if I'm just trying to fudge it or, oh, well, I'll just kind of do this on the fly, then it takes longer. But going through these procedures, very, very in a sort of structured way, in the tactical way that I have been talking about, and just taking that time, which is actually incredibly short, it the information does not take that long. It, I can't give you an exact figure because I'm not you and you're not me, and it really just depends on the extent to which 
you're going to practice it, but it can be very fast, and we're going to get into some speed examples. One thing that I would like to add, I mentioned Phil Chambers before that I have interviewed and haven't released the interview yet on the podcast, but he said that the thresholds of memory competition right now are only not being broken, because, and they are being broken every year, but the only reason why they're not being broken as much as he thinks that they can be has to do with the speed of the human hand. Right? So card memorization is being hindered by the fact that the hand can't move fast enough for, for the mind to memorize the cards as fast as he thinks he can. And they're actually building technology now and software programs that will flash the cards to the memory champions so that they don't have to use their hands to flip through them and test the speeds. So once you're rolling with this stuff, you can memorize incredibly fast. Now, this broaches the question of are you generating knowledge because you're doing it fast? And I also talked to another guy named Timothy Moser on the podcast, and one of the points that he raised, which I knew intuitively but never thought of it as something that one should point out, is that when you are memorizing this material, putting it in your mind instead of, ah, I remember reading something in a book and it sort of was like this, when you're putting it into a memory palace, these key points, you're actually enabling yourself to recall it, to savor it, to consider it, to be able to meditate upon it and really spread that out and create connections, lateral connections, not just top-down connections, but this way, that way. And I call that rhizomatic, actually, because rhizomes are these sorts of plants that don't have roots that go down, but the roots go sideways, and they sort of just pop up and that sort of thing. So the speed can happen very rapidly, but actually the goal should be to have integrity of information memorized, and then the ability to savor it and recall it and make connections after the fact so that you can enjoy it in peace and calm and benefit from it with time not really being an issue. But to be perfectly clear, the speed is up to you, the kind of uh, practice you want to put into it and to build your own experience. <coughs> I think one very important factor that you mentioned before um, and the dangers of recalling something successfully that you've already learned is uh, being under stress, right? Or stressing yourself out. Mm. I mean, I personally, I've, I've had issues with that because I personally always thought while, I'm, while I was learning, I have no time or I have to learn faster. And this, this voice was always saying those things, right? But in the end, it hindered me immensely mm. uh, learning something and also recalling something. Right, so it's really, really important to be in a state of relaxation, and um, so it it gets it, it becomes smoother mm. when when it comes to learning and recalling at the same time. 